liftoff. 32 minutes past the hour. Liftoff on Apollo 11. Oh, boy. Okay, so by now you've probably seen this shot a few times. The beginnings of that milestone mission to the moon. No one really disputes that it was a defining moment, unequaled in its ambition and its audacity. But the impact, easy to take for granted. In the 50 years that followed those small steps and giant leaps, we have technology that would have made Neil Armstrong's head spin. Explorer's been hit. Explorer, do you read? Movies and pop culture that maybe tell us more about ourselves than anything actually out there. Dave. Do you mind if I ask you a personal question? And ambitions? Well, there's no limit. I watched on television the ex exploits of those astronauts walking on the surface of the moon, and that culminated my dream to becoming, wanting to become an astronaut. It was scientists coming together and make something incredible happen over many, many years. It's a reminder of what we can do. Uh, and I, when I say we, I mean like the biggest we you can imagine, humanity. So, three people who've given a lot of thought to what Apollo 11 did for humankind. My name's Dave Williams, Canadian astronaut and veteran of two space shuttle flights. You're an astronaut. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'm but a... you're a robotics engineer. That's yeah, so cool. well. <laughs> I'm Sogan Talevi, fourth year space engineering student from York University. I don't know if you're a Star Trek oh, yeah. fan, but uh -huh. I mean... Uh, I think I, I've heard you're a bigger fan than me. I'm Eli Glasner. I'm an entertainment reporter, film critic, and a self-avowed space geek. Okay, so what I want to try to do in the next uh, 10 minutes or so is to try to unpack this idea of, you know, what it is we should all be taking away from the fact that something like the moon landing happened. I mean, half a century ago, and, and, and let's tease apart what kind of a course change that represented for humanity. And Dave, I, I want to start with you, because from a sort of science and, and technological standpoint, I mean, what did that moon landing set in motion for humanity? Well, first of all, the lunar landing transformed the way we think of our own planet and launched the environmental movement. But to get to the moon, those requirements basically led us to developing a whole generation of new technologies. Imagine the computing power that was required to send the spacecraft to the moon, land successfully, and then come back. And of course, during the landing of the Apollo 11 capsule, they had a computer error message, you know, based on the computers of those times. So that launched the whole generation of computing platforms that we have today, our smartphones in our pockets, or an evolution of the technology that was developed for Apollo. So again, how, how did you first become interested in, in the, the, the space of the space. space of, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was just um, when, since I was a little kid, my parents would read me from astronomy magazines instead of like normal bedtime stories. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't nursery rhymes. Or <laughs> no, <it> was, <laughs> no. Okay. It's, but, but it was cool, you know? It yeah. was like a whole other world. And um, they told me about different planets, and it was basically like, oh, they're you, there are different planets like Earth, but you can't really live on them. You might die because you have no oxygen. And I said, what's an oxygen? I'm like five years old. <laughs> right. uh, but that kind of got me interested into it. And then later on, I did a like, bunch of robotics with this organization, First Robotics. And I said, OK, I want to be in the engineering side, side of things. Right. But also astronauts are either medical professionals or in the military or engineers. Majority of them. Right. And, and so what's, then I what, chose engineering. OK, but, but what's the dream? Like, I feel like after the age of 20, you can't really say you want to become an astronaut anymore. You can, but it's a you're little bit. You're supposed to have outgrown you're that You're supposed ambition. to say, like, you know, I would like to aid in space exploration. <laughs> I see. But if you want to put me on a rocket, I'm all good. <laughs> and you, you had a recent experience mm -hmm. where you got to see another side. I mean, you, you were studying space, space law. Law. Yes. It was, it was for um, European Space Agency has outreach things that they do. And um, space law is a big part of it, as uh, he, you might know. Yeah. Sorry, an astronaut. <laughs> <laughs> You're excited about this. I, I, but um, it's a bigger other side of things that we don't see. Because with this space exploration, it's not just about the scientist you know, or um, working hard to make it happen. It's a big part of it is politics. You know, lawyers making it work between different nations and how it's going to work out. So it does take many, many people working together and coming together to make a space uh, flight or any space exploration happen. And space law looks into that. Right. Eli, 
I don't remember as a kid reading a whole lot of books or seeing movies about space lawyers. Yeah, no, that <laughs> that would be a failed show. <laughs> well, yeah, space and, lawyer, <laughs> I present you this summons, Saturn. Like what? No. Like. Well, yeah, and, and, but I mean, mo I mean, oh, most of our touch points with space, yeah. I mean, through our lives, have been things like like Star Trek and Star Wars and Guardians of the Galaxy. Yeah. I think so far in pop culture, we think of those pilots, we think of those men, you know, gripping the joystick and gritting their teeth and piloting their craft and smashing through the atmosphere. And, and it seems like it's just like an act of will. Like it's just yeah. because they were strong enough and brave enough and gosh darn it, like they did it. It's Han Solo, you know, in the Millennium Falcon. It's, it's, it's in Guardians of the Galaxy with Star-Lord and all of that, but and a raccoon, obviously. And a raccoon. A raccoon <laughs> has to be a raccoon. there. Well, Toronto has a lot of them, so maybe we have an yeah. advantage We can empathize. You yeah. never know. I mean, there, there aren't shows that capture necessarily that spirit of cooperation. It's right. interesting. I was recently uh, in Houston, uh, and they're talking about the next moon mission, the Artemis program. And they're talking about the spirit of international cooperation and all the various companies and countries that are going to be working together. That's not a sexy movie, right? That's not our way of telling the story of space, except, and you're a fan, I think Star Trek. Star Trek is one of the few examples yeah. of- I just up, Hugh There you go, but I mean, because it was, okay, this kind of utopian, how would we work together, not just us, but other species? So we talk about going from science fiction to science fact, and arguably what we saw in Star Trek back in the 60s with all these different cultures coming together on a spacecraft, we're living that on the space station every day now. Yeah. And that will be the future of space exploration, as people from all over the world coming together to explore on the behalf of humanity. But, but, so, so that's a really interesting point. I mean, the, this idea that what? I mean, space exploration drove all of this creativity, sure. right? This yeah. idea that, that you could push the limits well beyond the sky, right? But what are you saying? That, that those works, that ambition, those dreams actually turned into something real, that, it, that the cycle, it, it's fed itself. There's actually, there's no question about that. You think of the technologies that are portrayed in Star Trek, and you think about the tricorder, and you look at our smartphones that we have today and the capability that we have through those devices. In, when I was in university, I was taught that it's impossible to map the human genome. We've done that, and we're doing gene sequencing in space. So I say get rid of the letters I am out of the word impossible. It's about making the impossible possible from science fiction to science fact and looking forward at the next 50 years. It's going to be incredible. And you need, you need to dream it. Like, you need to explore those ideas first before you can actually do them. And I think right. that's what you can do in a, in a TV show or in movies. You look at a film like Interstellar from a few years ago, where these like amazing out of this world sequences bending uh, space and time and gravity. Like you can debate exactly what's happening and how achievable that is, but they're starting the process. They're saying, what if, what if, what if, and then maybe this and maybe that. And then down the road, someone goes, yeah, Okay, maybe, and, and you know, and we don't know. But but here's what I sometimes wonder about, uh, you know, whether it just kind of goes to show you how little we all actually understand about the very serious business of space exploration. But here's the thing, though. I feel like with space, with many other things, the more it's kind of like Pandora's box. The more you open, the more you realize how much more we have to explore. I mean, it wasn't many years ago when we didn't know there were other galaxies. You know, you know, and it opens up so many different worlds and universes when you start kind of learning more and more. But Dave, it, it doesn't bother you that, that most people's touch point with what you have devoted your life to is laser beams and, and pew pew and you know warp drives, <laughs> that sort of thing? I think it's exciting because it captures our imagination. And it's all about capturing your imagination and translating those ideas into proposals for new technologies that will help us go farther into space. Right. You know, you think about time in the context of exploring our solar system, going to the moon, three days. The missions last, you know, days to weeks. Going to Mars, it's gonna be a totally different scenario. Six months to get there and the mission overall will be a three-year mission. Going far farther in our solar system, unless we have a new generation of spacecraft, it's going to take a huge amount of time. But, but let, me, let me just push you on one thing, because I, I wonder if we need to do a better job of, of 
of informing people or having people understand exactly what it is that's actually going up there. Does the Canadian Space Agency and NASA, NASA have to do a better job of, of being transparent about yeah, that sort of stuff? I think we all have to do a better job of sharing the excitement and the passion for space. The technologies we use in space, for instance, the Canada Arm on the space station has been modified to create NeuroArm, a neurosurgical robot that enables neurosurgeons to perform precision procedures. And what we do to support humans in space with these new technologies enables them to stay longer and to go far and those technologies for space will help us back here on Earth. And you think about where we're at today from a technological perspective compared to 50 years ago, imagine where we're going to be 50 years from now when we have humans living and working on the surface of Mars and it's routine to see humans on another planet in our solar system. I want to ask all of you one last question, the same question, and that's simply, what excites you most when you look forward to not the last 50 years, but the next 50 years? So again, maybe I'll start with you. I want to make sure that I also play a part in the next 50 years. I want to make sure that I'm pretty sure there are many scientists and many engineers looking up at the moon landing and they said, you know what, I wrote like one line of code for that. I want to look at the next, you know, big thing and say, I did something and I was part of it. You want to be able to say mission successful. I, yeah, mission accomplished. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you are. I mean, there's a reason why when Hollywood's trying to capture attention, they look to the stars, right? And we have new movies on the way with Brad Pitt and Natalie Portman and more because it is one of those like amazing feats filled with awe. I want and I'm excited to look forward to a day when we're all paying attention to not science fiction, but something like that, where again, the world stops as we wait to see that woman take the first step on the moon and everyone will be looking at their screens big and small and it will be because we came together humanity cooperated the best of our instincts and intentions and pulled that off and got back there and then maybe beyond i mean that's that's more than spectacle like that is that is a, an amazing moment and i if i can witness that with my like i'm used to reliving these things <laughs> as movies and shows, but to actually experience that, I, I don't even know what I would feel. Dave, you get the last word. So 50 years ago, I was told that my dream of becoming an astronaut was impossible. I had a chance to ride on the Canada Arm with a Canadian flag on my shoulder helping build the space station. So my dream is for the next generation, for Canada to continue to grow as a major spacefaring nation. And thinking about somewhere in Canada right now, there might be a seven-year-old growing up dreaming of becoming that next generation Canadian astronaut. Or a 22-year-old. <laughs> that will one day walk on Mars, that will invent the next generation of robots that we're going to be using in space and that is really exciting to continue the evolution of what we started 50 years ago and think about where we're going to be 50 years from now. Eli, Dave, so again, thanks so much. Thank Pleasure. you.